My name is Dr. Aljibola. In this video, we want to start a cardiovascular series and we want to start with embryology. At embryology, the heart is the first functional organ in developing embryo and it develops from the lat lateral plate mesoderm. And neural crest cells migrate into the truncus arteriosus to form the aortico-pulmonary septum. Endocardial cushions help in the septation of the chambers and also formation of the heart valves. The heart starts beating at week 4 of development. And if you look at this diagram, we have the ectoderm, we have our mesoderm in the center, and we also have our endoderm. And in the lateral aspect of the mesoderm, that's where actually the act developed from, as been illustrated by this diagram. Act to five dilatations. So as as the development of the art is progressing, the act to form five dilatations, namely from the cranial to the caudal aspect. From the cranial aspect, we have our truncus arteriosus, which is going to form the outflow. We have our bubbles codis the primitive ventricle, primitive atrium, and the sinus venosus, which is going to form the inflow. The sinus venosus receives blood from vitelline or omphalomesentery vein, umbilical vein, and the common cardinal vein. Let's talk about the adult derivative of most of these structures. From truncus arteriosus is going to form the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk. Bubbles codis is going to form the smooth part of the left and right ventricle. Primitive atrium is going to form the trabeculated part of the left and the right atrium. Primitive ventricle is going to form the trabeculated part of left and right ventricle. Primitive pulmonary vein is going to form the smooth part of left atrium. Left arm or sinus venosus is going to form the coronary sinus, which is going to drain the, the myocardium. Right arm or sinus venosus form the smooth part of the right atrium. Right cardinal vein form the superior vena cava. Our endocardial pushing is going to form the atrial septum, membranous intravascular septum, along with the valves. Next is the three layers of the ART2. The heart tube consists of three layers starting from inside. We have the endocardium, which is the inter internal endothelial lining of the heart. We have our myocardium. We have the epicardium or the visceral pericardium, which is the outside covering of the tube. So if you look at the picture, so we have inside, which is the endocardium, followed by the muscular layer, which is the myocardium. And, if, and the outer layer, which is the epicardium. And if you look at the diagram, the inner part is the part that, re that receives the least amount of oxygen or the least amount of blood flow. And that's why the inner part is more prone to ischemia, like um, subendocardiac ischemia, which we want to talk about when we get to pathology. Left to right polarity of the heart tube, the primary heart tube loops to establish left-right polarity by the help of the dynein and don't forget dynein is a molecular multiprotein in the microtubule that helps to transport retrograde to microtubule and then from positive to negative and if there's any defect in this dynein for instance if you have defect in the left to right dynein of the whole body it can lead to a condition called cytos inversus whereby you have all the whole organ on the opposite side for instance remember the liver is on the right side so the liver can be on the left side also the spleen which is normally on the left side can now be on the right side also it also applies to the lungs normally on the right side we have three lobes of the lungs so in this patient they want to have three lobes of lungs on the left side and on the right side they want to have two lobes of the lungs and also they are asking to be on also instead of being on the left side they want to be on the on the on the right side and if there's a defect in the left to right dining of just only the heart that can lead to a condition that we call destrocardia. 
and in those patients the point of their maximum impulse or their apical impulse instead of being on the left is going to be on the right in this patient. So let's talk about the septation of the cardiac chambers. The cardiac septa form between week 4 and week 8 of development. So we want to divide our atrium into two. So, so now we'll be talking about the atrial septation. So we have our atria here and our goal is to divide the atria into, into two. So we want, to, we want to establish the right atrium and the left atrium by forming our atrial septum. So I'm going to form the atrial septum. So from the roof, from the roof of the common atrium, we have our, our septum going downward towards the endocardial cushion. And then because this is the first septum that is growing from the roof of the common atrium, we want to call it the primary septum. So we call it a fancy name, septum primum. And as it's growing towards the endocardial cushion, the space between the septum and the endocardial cushion, because it's a first foramen, we want to call it the foramen primum. So we want to refer it as the foramen primum. The hepatosis, so as the septum primum, as it's growing towards the endocardial cushion, the hepatosis creates a O in between the septum. And this O that is created, so this is going to be our second O that we want to be seeing. I mean, our second foramen that will be seen. So we want to call it the foramen secundum because it's the second foramen. And as development continues, the septum primal grows towards the endocardial cushion, so they are thereby closing the foramen primal. So we are we want to be left with the foramen secundum. And in the next slide, the septum secundum develops as foramen secundum maintain the right to the left shunt. So if you, if you look at this picture, we can see that the distal part of the septum primal has already fused with the endocardial cushion. And we have a new septum that is coming from the roof because this is a second septum that is coming from the roof. We want to call it the septum secundum. And then the space between both of them is what we want to refer to as our foramen over, which is going to help us to maintain the right to the left shunt of blood, so the movement of blood from the right side to the left side of the heart. In the next picture, we can see that we have our the septum secundum be at be suspended to the roof of the atrium, and also our septum. We also have our septum primum attached to the endocardial cushion, and the space between both of them is what we call foramen ova. So at the end, the septum secundum suspended by the roof and the septum primal attached to the endocardial cushion, the space between both is what we call the foramen ova. And this allows right to left shunting of blood in the utero. And then what happens after the child is born? So after the child is born, the pressure on the left side increases to be more than the pressure on the right side. And then this now pushes the septum primal against the septum secundum, thereby closing the, the foramen over. So let's talk about the pathology associated with this condition. So pathology associated with an atrial septum formation pathology. So the first one we want to talk about is patent foramen over. And what's patent foramen over? This is when both the septum primum and septum secundum failed to fuse together so there's a failure of fusion so caused by failure of septum primum and septum secundum to fuse after the child is born and then this condition is usually asymptomatic but one of the complications is that it can lead to what we call paradoxical emboli or paradoxical embolism and what's paradoxical embolism is somebody that have DVT because normally somebody have DVT, one of the complications of deep venous thrombosis is that it can lead to pulmonary embolism because if somebody has a clot in their femoral, let, let's say for instance, let's say a patient have a clot in the femoral vein, from the femoral vein it can gain entry into the inferior vena cava and from there it can gain entry into the 
right side of the heart and ideally from the right side of the heart the, the blood from the right side of the heart normally goes to the lungs so that means the clot is supposed to go to the lungs and cause problem in the lungs thereby causing pulmonary embolism but because some patient because for instance in these patients because they have a patent for a over so instead of the clot going directly to their lungs the clot actually passes through the the foramen over and moving from the right side to the left side and from there it can gain access into the stem circulation so it can go to the brain and cause stroke and it can also go to the other organs in the body thereby causing infection of those organs the next one is propatency of foramen over propatency of foramen over and what does this mean this incomplete fusion of septum primum and septum secundum thereby forming a narrow oblique cleft between the atrium and it does not allow intracardial shunting of uh, what's called a blood which is a good thing about it the next pathology we'll be talking about is atraceptor defect atraceptor defect is one of the causes of late sinus remember late sinus is caused by atraceptor defect our ventricular septa defect and a patent doctor at so we shall talk about it later. so this is actually one of the causes of the late sinuses and it's normally left to right shunting of blood and don't forget remember the type of blood that is coming from the left to the right is is oxygenated blood remember the oxygenated blood on the left come to the right side right and because of that they don't really have what's called them sinuses and the incidence is approximately 10 percent of all congenital heart disease is also with patient with them it's also with patient with fetal alcoholic syndrome down syndrome patient actually the primal type the osteo secondum is actually the most common and this is due to excessive cell death the apoptosis and resorption of the septum primal or inadequate development of the septum secondum so thereby leaving a space in the osteo in the atria septum and allowing the left to right shunting of blood as opposed to the primal type of ASD this is less common than septum secundum this is less common than the septum than the than secundum ASD and it occurs in the lower aspect of the atrial wall and results in formation of septum primal to fuse with the endocardial cushion and if endocardial cushion is involved a primary ASD can also be associated with membranous intravascular septum because if you guys remember remember it's the same endocardial cushion that help us to form the membranous intravascular septum and also help us to form our valve so this patient can also have some valvular defects so let's talk about the clinical findings that we can see in patient with um, ASD intraceptor defects so if you look at this di diagram so there's a we have a space between the the atria and this space because remember normally after after the child is born the pressure on the left side is normally more than the pressure on the right side so because of that we want to have a left to right shunting of blood so that means the ox the oxygenated blood from the left atrium is going to be shunting into the right atrium and meaning that in the right atrium we want to have increased oxygen saturation there because normally remember normally the blood that normally comes to the right side of the heart they are deoxygenated blood but because the oxygenated blood from the left atrium is coming to the right atrium that is going to increase the oxygen saturation in the right atrium and it also lead to increased oxygen saturation in the right ventricle and also in the pulmonary artery so that means in patient with ASD we expect to see increased oxygen saturation in the right atrium right ventricle and the pulmonary artery also on that thing we can also see in these patients is that because of increased blood flow in the because of our increase in the amount of blood that's getting or the volume of blood that's getting to the right atrium that is going to lead to increase in blood flowing through the tricuspid valve during diastole remember the tricuspid valve opens during diastole and that can lead to that can cause a murmur in the what's called in the tricuspid valve and that's why we have a diastolic murmur at the lower standard border due to increased blood flow through the tricuspid valve another thing we can also see in these patients because of the increased blood flow to the right side of the heart we can also have increased blood flow increased blood flow through the pulmonary artery and this can also cause a soft 
miss systolic murmur along the upper standard border due to increased pulmonary blood flow. Remember, we want our pulmonary valve to be open during systole. So that's why the murmur is going to occur during systole. And that's we also see in this patient is what we call wide fixed splitting of S2 assign. And we want to talk about that one later. But, but from now, I want you guys to remember that anytime you see wide fixed splitting on the exam, think of ASD. Wide fixed splitting, think of ASD. And when we get to physiology, we want to talk about different type of splitting and, um, and also in different conditions that you can see different type of splitting. So what are the complications of this ASD? Not, not about one of the complications that we can see in this patient is what we call SMN gas syndrome. And what's SMN gas syndrome? These are the clinical findings that we see in the patient. That these are the clinical findings that we see in patient when left to right shunt becomes right to left shunt. Because if you look at also if you look at this diagram, remember normally we said that um, in patient with ASD, they normally have shunting of blood from the left side. To the right side and because of the shunting of blood that increase the amount of or the volume of blood that's in the right atrium also increase the volume of blood in the right ventricle and increasing leads to increase in the volume of blood flowing to the pulmonary artery and then because of the increased amount of blood that's flowing to the pulmonary artery right but the pulmonary artery have to have to do some adaptation to be able to also call them accommodate this increase in what's called them in the volume of blood. And one of the adaptations that occurs in the pulmonary artery is smooth muscle hyperplasia or hypertrophy. And a disc, and a because of that, that can lead to narrowing of the pulmonary artery. And because of the narrowing of the pulmonary artery can decrease the, the radius of the pulmonary artery. And then don't and then remember that anytime there is decrease in the radius, that leads to increase in resistance to the flow. And because of the increase in resistance to the flow, that's going to increase the pressure in the pulmonary artery. And because of the pre increased pressure in the pulmonary artery, that can lead to pulmonary hypertension. And that means the right ventricle needs to increase its pressure to be able to push the blood into the pulmonary artery. Remember, blood flows based on pressure gradient, meaning that blood flow from high pressure to low pressure. So that means right ventricle needs to increase its pressure to be able to push the blood into the pulmonary artery and then with time that will lead to increase in right ventricular pressure and also the right atrium also needs to increase its pressure so that it can push the blood to the increase and what's called into the right ventricle so that means the pressure in the right atrium is also going to increase and the pressure in the right atrium will keep increasing until you get to a point whereby the pressure in the right atrium is more than the pressure in the left atrium and at this point our left to right shunt is going to now become right to left shunt and at this point you can know, you can see that what's called them initially the blood that was coming from the left to the right was oxygenated blood but at this point the blood that has to be shunting from the right to the left now is a deoxygenated blood and because of that now that means you want to have increased amount of deoxygenated blood in the left atrium increase in deoxygenated blood get to the left ventricle and that can lead to increase deoxygenated blood getting to the what to the aorta also to the systemic circulation and at this point this patient has to have what cyanosis and that's why ASD is considered as late cyanosis other thing that this patient can also have they can also have heart failure and they can also develop a paradoxical embolism which we already explained and the last pathology that is associated with atrial receptor formation that we want to talk about in this PowerPoint or in this presentation is premature closure of ova formation. So in the utero, if patient have um, premature closure of the of the foramen ova, so that means there's this to prevent the right to left sh right to left shunting of blood, and uh, this can lead to uh, what's called them right heart failure. So it can lead to massive right atria and right ventricular enlargement and then because enough blood is not getting because blood or enough blood is not getting to the left side of the heart then to lead to underdeveloped left side of the heart and then that usually occurs shortly after after birth and this is the end of my presentation so join me to, uh, what's called the next time for another cardiovascular another cardiovascular series in um, embryology thank you guys